Good evening. It's good to see you tonight. Thank you for being out. We have visitors with us. We have Wilburn and Shirley Williams from Texas. They've been up here before, but good to have them back uh, for a brief, brief visit. And we have them with us tonight. But um, lesson six is where we're at. Honor one another. We're studying one another Christianity from the Roger Hillis workbook. All right. As we go through these studies of one another Christianity, something I'd like for us to, you know, be thinking about as we complete a lesson, to be thinking a, a more a focused on how we can better carry that out. Um, our first lesson was members of one another. Of course, that's a reminder of, one of the reminders there is how we're connected to one another in the body of Christ, how we are dependent upon each other and the functioning of, of the body of Christ uh, to do our part and how each one is needed. Serving one another, just, you know, be thinking about, okay, how can I be a better servant? Uh, what can I do to, to serve uh, a member or the members here and others and care for one another? Uh, how can I do better in that area? Encourage one another. How can I be more like Barnabas? Last week, greeting one another to grow in these areas is the point. Uh, and then with our lesson tonight, to honor one another. When we think about honor, you know, Romans 13, 7, that's the scripture the lesson begins with. It's included on the right margin there of the book. But it reads, render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Of course, that verse is in the context, really going back to verse 1 in particular, of these governing, governing authorities that God himself has ordained that we are to uh, be in subjection to. And that's where we find really this verse particularly connected to when we find honor to whom honor. And yet... It was mentioned in the previous chapter. It's mentioned in many verses in the New Testament, as you see in that uh, table there on page 25. But as we think of the word honor, uh, what does that mean, to honor? Ken? I think it would carry with it the idea of respect, uh, possibly would include taking care of others. Okay. So, last time we think of the word honor, one of the, I think one of the first words that come to our mind is the, what you said is respect. That we have respect for someone and that we thus show respect in the way that we treat them and the way that we address them, perhaps. Okay. And then even, as you said, even a deeper, I think, meaning that sometimes is missed in the word honor, sometimes the way it's used is even taking care of someone like aged parents, okay? And Jesus addresses that in the Bible as well. Lots of times we think of honor father and mother, one of the Ten Commandments, something that Paul, of course, teaches in Ephesians 6, 2 and 3. And we think of maybe small, as we're little children and growing up and we're teaching our kids, you need to respect, you need to honor your parents, and yes, that we need to do that, but then... Sometimes maybe we, we, we forget that that carries on, is, is to carry on uh, throughout life that yeah, we show honor to our parents. In fact, didn't Jesus get on to some grown men for failing to do that? Remember in Matthew 15, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, they're, they're all worked up because the disciples have not kept a tradition of the Jews that have been passed down, handed down, of not washing their hands in a special ceremonial way before they eat. And Jesus rebukes them for laying aside and rejecting the commandments of God for their traditions. And the one he calls them out on in particular is, you don't honor your father and mother. You, you, you try to get around that with this loophole. And, and so he rebukes these grown men who have older parents so they don't maybe take away their finances and their money and having to support their, their aged parents. But we even see that in 1 Timothy 5, right? And we'll get to that a little bit later with widows and 
family and responsibilities there. And so, yeah, respect, but then as Ken said, even in a deeper way, maybe taking care of someone. Um, there's esteem there. When you think about honor, great esteem, uh, a recognition. And the word literally means, do you know? If you look it up, you know, what that word means from the Greek, the New Testament was written in Greek, value. You value. So, if, if a child honors their father, if they honor the mother, they're learning to value their parents, and that's a good thing, right? That's a healthy thing. Um, we honor God. I mean, there's the highest esteem and, and honor, right, and reverence even there, but how much we value that relationship and we value God. But think about we value our parents and, and hopefully we grow in that as we get older and how much they did for us and now maybe as we have children and that, re that respect and that honor grows even more about what they've done for us. So, some not, not everyone experiences that, granted, but those of us who have uh, can, can really appreciate that and then wanting to repay as Paul speaks of in 1 Timothy 5, but value is intrinsic in that word of honor. Okay. So we have this table here of numerous people that the Bible tells us we are to honor. And so it says, read the scriptures listed below, tell who we're to honor and then tell how we should show honor to them. John 5, 22 and 23. Let's go there. Let me start in the middle here with Todd and Bonnie. Todd, if you'll take John 5, Bonnie, Romans 12, 10. Ken, 1 Corinthians 12, 22 through 24. Uh, Jesse, 1 Corinthians 12, 26. Lena, Ephesians 6, 2. Uh, Marissa, 1 Timothy 1, 17. Skip. Brad, 1 Timothy 5, 3. Teresa, 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. And then uh, you boys reading back there. Sorry. On you, yes. What about you, Norm? Sorry? All right, so give me 1 Timothy 6 1 and uh, Jason, 2 Timothy 2 20 and 21, and Norm, uh, first, Norm A, 1 Peter 2 17, and then uh, John, 1 Peter 3 7, please. All right, I think I got everybody. Okay, John 5 22 through 23. For not even the Father judges anyone, but He has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. Okay, so the who is Jesus and the Father, and how do we show that honor? Now this context, and it's specifically mentioned what Todd just read, what's the son going to do one day? Judge. Judge. In fact, we keep reading, we, what do we come across? The hour is coming when he's going to call all who are in the graves to come forth, right? The just and the unjust, It'll be a resurrection of life, a resurrection of condemnation, but all are going to be judged. That right there ought to get our undivided attention, and here's one we better honor, and we better honor his law, because for John 12, 48, his words are going to judge us. And so we honor the, uh, the son and we honor the father by honoring the son by being obedient, right, to what the son tells us to do. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? That's not honoring Jesus to claim him as our Lord, say, I love you, Jesus, and then we don't live according to what he tells us to do. Um, anyone want to add to that? John 5? Who you? You point at somebody, Norm? You mentioned what I was going to say. It's just the, the last verse does mention that you honor the Father through honoring the Son, but you can't do one without the other. So. Yeah, no, and, and, uh, and so the Son, He honored His Father by doing His will. We are to honor the Son by doing His will, and by doing so, we're going to honor God right in the process. God, the honor of God, the honor of Jesus, they obviously were failing to do so. 
Good job. Uh, Bonnie, Romans 12.10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Okay. So who do we honor here, Paul says? Our brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Our brethren. How do we do that? He even says a specific way here, right? In honor giving what? Preference. To one another. Does that remind you of another New Testament passage or two? I mean, one in particular comes to me right away. Maybe you too. I don't know. That's it, Bill. Yeah, Philippians 2, 3, and 4. You know, do nothing through selfish ambition or conceit, but lowliness of mind. Esteem others better than yourselves. Look out, not out, look out not only for your own interest, but for the interest of others. Yeah. So, an honor, an honor giving preference to one another. Is that what we see in the world? For the most part, people act, thinking, acting, treating each other that way. No, knocking them over to kind of climb over them, right? Uh, but that's not to be the way of the follower of Christ, right? And what a difference it makes uh, that we show that kind of honor towards one another. Now, does it, does it distinguish if it's a particular member, then we don't have to? Well, not him or not her. Doesn't, doesn't. Just a general instruction about brotherly love, brotherly affection for one another. That ought to lead to then this in, in, in honor giving preference to one another. So it's obviously connected to, I don't know if I'm still in your thunder here. It's obviously connected to the love we have for each other in the body of Christ. Jason, you had anything? Was that in your soul? All right, go ahead, yeah, and that idea, I think one translation just said preferring one another. Um, I have in my margin here, take the lead in showing deference as a, as a definition for this. So deference uh, is the idea of stepping back, letting someone else take that position, right? And it's the idea. So I think of 1 Corinthians 6 where it says, why not rather be defrauded? Let your, let your brother defraud you even in that instance this isn't not if you're trying to encourage fraud right. but it's step out of the way and let someone else take the lead that's a, a way to honor others sure yeah good example okay ken you ready yeah. so we're going to first corinthians 12 22 through 24. there's no matter no no much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on those we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that <coughs> part which lacks it. Okay. So, who are we told to give honor to specifically here in these verses? Okay, so verse 23, and, and, though, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. I wonder who that'd be talking about. Norm? Nobody sees them and yet if they're gone, what a, what a gap they leave. And uh, we, we would consider, they would be considered, when I look at the word weaker here, I'm looking at somebody that is not as pretentious. Somebody does not step it out into the front. They appear to be less, but in fact, they are more. Yeah. So, you know, obviously, verse 22, proceeding, what I emphasize, says, and that's where Ken began reading, no much rather those members of the body who seem to be weaker. <coughs> Are necessary. So from the quote unquote teacher's manual book, because it's not called the teacher manual book, but it just has more material than the workbook we are, we're primarily using. Uh, he says there on this passage, Roger Hillis, these verses acknowledge that there are different levels of spiritual maturity within every local church. 
There will always be those of great maturity and those who are babes in Christ. Paul is dealing in this passage with how we are to treat those who are weaker spiritually, and he says they are to be given honor, special honor. They must never be ridiculed or made to feel unimportant to the body. They must be made to feel valuable and important, and how we treat them must contribute to that sense of worth. They must understand that we are glad to have them as members of our church family in the Lord and know that we value their contributions to the Lord's work at their level of participation. And of course, obviously, for any of us, there ought to be, and even with the, if that's the case, the weaker, the, maybe the immature uh, in Christ, there should continue to be growth and maturity going on too. Uh, go ahead. Refer to uh, physically weaker people. That's the people that we go and visit because they can't come and attend. That's the people to whom we take lunch or dinner because uh, they couldn't uh, do it for themselves or because they need help and therefore we give them more honor, more attention. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think we would say it wouldn't include such individuals. Um, I mean, that makes sense to me. There's other scriptures that certainly uh, bear that out for sure, like First Thessalonians 5.14. Um, about those who are weak, those who are faint-hearted. Um, Hebrews chapter 12 talks about strengthening the hands that hang down and the feeble knees and, and to help make them straight or, or so they don't become dislocated. So uh, there's passages like that that, that encourage us, instruct us to uh, see to those that are maybe physically weak as well, not just necessarily spiritually weak, and even when you say those who are based in Christ, not necessarily talk about spiritually weak so much as just their level of maturity, that they're based in Christ, and they're younger in the faith, and so they haven't had as many years uh, in the Lord's body to continue to grow and develop, but I think that point is very valid. Thank you, Lord. I can't help but think about the, uh, the use of the term weak, weaker uh, in connection with the weaker vessel mm -hmm. as the description of life and the relationship. And and the and that in that particular case, that's, similar, that's John's passage. Yes, still. right. <laughs> <laughs> a similar sense is used uh, here in that that weaker vessel is one that is of more value because of its like the fine china versus the mug you get for a dollar. Uh, it's it is more fragile, and yet it has a greater value. <coughs> And you see that value in its uniqueness and what it and what it brings to the relationship. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. So let's go to First Corinthians twelve twenty six. I mean, we're there. Hopefully, J uh, Jesse. One member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. This is very similar to Romans twelve fifteen. I think right. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Um, which one do you think is easier to do in verse 26? If there's a member suffering, to suffer with that member, or if a member is honored to rejoice with that member? Which one do you think is e maybe a little bit easier for us to do? Erica? Well, rejoice first, but I think it's because whether, like in this specific context here of spiritual <coughs> gifts, here, Paul had addressed the fact that just because you maybe in your eyes had a different <clears throat> gift or a better gift than someone else, you weren't above them. You're not more special than them. Mm -hmm. Give honor to those who you think even may not have a, as good of a gift as you. You shouldn't be haughty in that. But when you suffer on that same idea, Paul's whole point here is humble yourself. Put yourself beneath someone else. And suffering with someone, you ha we, do we don't enjoy suffering. Yeah. So you have to humble yourself to meet somebody on that level of suffering. So, I don't necessarily disagree. Hilla says the first part of that verse is relatively easy. When something happens that causes another Christian sorrow, we rally a around that one and help to ease the pain. It may be a death in the family, a serious illness, a rebellious child, or any number of things that can break the heart. Whatever it is that causes the hurt disciples should be there to help ease the pain. I think we are for the most part, 
And then he says, but it seems to be a little more difficult in some ways to rejoice with those who rejoice. Sometimes the success of another brings out feelings of jealousy or envy rather than jubilation. Many times we think it should be us enjoying the success and it can be, it can be hard to give credit where credit is due when it's due to someone else. That just ought not to be so. We should be grateful for every good thing that happens to others and, each, and such success and honor should be met with excitement and joy. So I, I, I can see that side of it um, because I think brethren, for the most part, we can be good about being there for each other, supporting each other through difficult times, hopefully. But when there's maybe someone's being honored and I'm not being honored or I think I should have been honored and so been recognized, uh, we got to be careful about the kind of attitudes we may be develop. And you kind of touched on that with what's was specifically going on in Corinth, because he he deals with the, the the strife and the envy among them and the competitive nature going on with these spiritual gifts that they had, especially those who had the tongue seemed to kind of put themselves up on a pedestal uh, type thing. So, uh, Lena. For a while, like somebody has the second, the third baby, and I'm just not able to uh, have a baby, and you have a hard time rejoicing with that person, and the same with everything. Somebody has a bad relationship, and you, you're looking at this other couple that's been together for 50 years, and it's like, why don't I have it? So, especially when you want that, and you see others having it, and you don't, it's hard to be happy with that. Right, right. So again, we have to be careful, check ourselves and our, our attitudes towards one another. Teresa? I think God has basically laid the foundation for us of like how our attitude should be, how, how we can maneuver these <coughs> sinful thoughts um, in our hearts and mold our hearts to be like Him. Um, even though it's difficult, He's given us all these stepping stones and these fail safes because even though we feel that way and we can't rejoice with that person you can turn to your brother or your sister and say this is how I'm feeling I know it's wrong I need help you know there's other you don't have to struggle on your own um, in that simple behavior you can always reach out and then help help yourself to learn how to deal with that envy jealousy, anger, when you're sh you should be re honoring and rejoicing with another brother or sister. Right, right. Uh, well, good thoughts, well said. I mean, it can, it can be, I think, a challenge or struggle for us, right, to reveal ourselves if we're struggling with something like that, right, to share that with somebody, um, to confide in someone, I need, need help with this. Is that kind of what you were saying, to, yeah. to let that be known? And, we can be guarded against people knowing that we are, we're thinking or feeling that way, right? But um, we should also have relationships with one another where we can do that and we can trust one another that we're coming to someone we respect that's a Christian that can give us some sound advice and encouragement or even a love, loving rebuke and admonishment that we need as well. Todd? It's really easy to honor those who are honorable. Um, but here, this command to honor those who are less honorable, that's hard, right? Because we tend to respect the people who command a lot of respect. Uh, the example of the spiritual gifts, I think, is great because this person's been honored with this tongue from heaven, and they think, well, therefore, I'm, I'm great. But he's, they're told, you need to go get an interpreter and let all things be done for edification. The whole point of you getting that tongue is to edify who? The, the weak, the people who need that, that knowledge. And, and we don't have spiritual gifts today, but the same concept is true. Why do we have a teaching program? Why do, we, why do we have a Bible class? Well, it's for the weak. It's for people who don't understand something to start to understand something. It's not to, uh, to please the strong or to, for, the, for a few strong people to to get together and share what they already know. It's how can we help the weaker people become stronger? Yeah, well, it's for everyone. But we all benefit, but, uh, but yeah, especially. It's for us all to come to maturity, so we think, well, how do we help the less mature become mature? Yeah, yeah. appreciate it. Good points. Uh, Lena, I think I stole your thunder from this passage at the very beginning of the class, but Ephesians 6, verse 2. 
Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, was promised. Yeah, first three, you can't have a promise, right? That is, uh, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Okay, so this is one of the, obviously, ten commandments from the Old Testament, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, and yet here we find it in the New Testament, so God expects children to be brought up in this way, uh, to treat, to, we already talked about the meaning of that word, to, yes, respect, but to value and to even later, 1 Timothy 5, 3, as we'll get into, even take care of, if needed, uh, one's aged parents. Um, anything you want to add to that? Anyone on Ephesians 6, 2 and 3? Like, uh, honoring being a way to respect others, it is respecting others. I think for most everyone, there's going to be a time in in your life where you do not have your parents with you. You, know, you can still honor them by you know, not talking poorly about them to others and you know, acting the, the proper way, yeah, the, the, way, way you, life. the way that you've been raised. Mm -hmm. If you've been raised right. um, to, to do good things, maintain those good things and honoring your parents in that way, I think it's a great way to do it without being able to, I guess, honor them directly. Yes. So, something that we will always want to be on top on, of course, is parents, you know, our, the way our children speak to us, uh, how they treat us, and um, how they address us, that it's with respect, and when it's not, to address that and not just let it slide, okay? I remember plenty of times when I was corrected verbally and physically, uh, for disrespect to my father, to my mother. I remember one time, okay, because there was a disrespect. Um, now, you and your spouse, you discuss and decide, and then let God's word guide you, not me, on how you're going to train your children to respect you and obey you. But uh, it, it, it matters how our children talk to us and how thus they, we allow them to talk to us if it's not proper and right, they're going to do that to other people in authority uh, as well. So uh, just want to emphasize that before we move on. Okay, First Timothy 1, 17. I think we got to Marissa. The King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so who here? Are we to honor? Okay. God. And notice the things said about God here. I mean, God, our King, our Creator, He's our Heavenly Father, He's the Eternal One. He is the One in whose being dwells immortality. And He is the One who ought to receive all honor and glory forever and ever. One thing Hillis says, he says it would not be possible to be too reverent when it comes to God. It would not be possible to over obey him. Uh, we must be first, or excuse me, he must be first in all that we do and everything we do must be done in a way that would bring honor and glory to him. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Okay. So obviously we think of worship, but just the way we live our life uh, before him, we need to honor him and think about the things that we do. Does this bring him honor? Does this bring him dishonor? And that uh, will correct a lot of bad behavior or th behavior that could be, end up being bad or going the wrong way if we think about that. If the, is this going to glorify God or is this going to dishonor him? Okay, and let that guide our decisions in life. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, 3. Honor widows who are actually widows. Okay. And go ahead and read uh, verse 4, if you will, Brad. Sure. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to show proper respect for their own family and to give back compensation to their parents. This is acceptable in the sight of God. So what was that line about compensation? 
Say give back. Compensation. Okay. So the New King James has to repay, and that's the same idea there. Give, give compensation. You, you take care of them. That's what we're talking about with the Pharisees and scribes that Jesus called them out on. You're not doing this. You're not keeping that command towards your parents to take care of them. And you're trying to skirt that responsibility. And uh, obviously God will hold us accountable if we, if we do not uh, show that kind of honor and value and care for our parents, whether that's having them into our own home or uh, making sure they're provided for in uh, a facility if we can't do that. Um, but verse 3 is what's being emphasized because it has the word honor here. Honor widows who are really widows, and the context tells us who that is, right? And so, who, who are those who, what does it mean to honor widows who are really widows? What's, what's the context telling us here? Ken? I think is another translation, uh, is uh, one who has reached a certain age and doesn't have uh, children or family to take care of her, mm -hmm. then uh, the church would have the responsibility. And the church would have the responsibility to be taken in, to, to honor that way financially, to provide for, as he says, if they're of a certain age, verse 9 and 10, and other qualifications that are mentioned there. So yeah, they don't, she doesn't have family to take care of. Uh, then if these qualifications are met, then the, the church is to provide. And in that way, honor here means financial. We're going to see it again here in verses 17 and 18. And as I look at the clock, I got to keep it moving. Who's up, Teresa? Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scriptures say, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the rain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Okay, so we got elders here in the context, but it speaks of if they who rule well be worthy of double honor. Double honor, okay. So the first honor, and it says if they rule well, which implies not all who are appointed as elders rule well, but if they do, they rule well, they may be worthy of double honor. Well, first of all, men in that position that meet those qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, they are to be given honor, right? To be given our respect. In fact, we're told to submit and obey them. Obey those who rule over you. Hebrews 13, uh, 17, uh, 1 Peter 5, uh, 1 through 4. Um, but what about this double, double honor? And the verse, the, the verse Teresa read right after that, one comes from the Old Testament that Peter, Paul quotes, and the other one comes from Luke 10, the New Testament, but it deals with providing what? Support, financial support. So if you have an elder or elders in the church that are um, regularly teaching, preaching, then... Uh, same passage that is also used for gospel preachers, by the way, in 1 Corinthians, uh, about you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. And then he adds the labor is worthy of his wages. That's the double honor there. Obviously, they're due respect, number one, because they're an elder in the church. But number two, maybe even financially then, to be compensated for the, that work they're doing in the local church. Okay? All right. Um, 1 Timothy 6, 1... Slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of our God, of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. Okay, so who is to be honored here? Yes, the bond servant who's under the yoke is to count their own masters worthy of all, all honor. Why? Here's some motivation so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. Okay. Well, obviously we read in the Bible a lot about masters and servants, but lots of times we take from that just a principle of truth in the workplace where you've got a boss, an employee, and we know Ephesians and Colossians, both those epistles, Paul tells those churches, whether you're the master or whether you're the servant, this is how you are to be. This is how you treat your master. This is how you treat your servant. And remember who's your master. 
you'll say to the masters. And when you, you, uh, uh, you do your work heartily as unto the Lord, as the one whom we will receive our inheritance. So there's that motivation, whether, whatever role or position you're in, right? But, but here specifically, how the bondservant is to honor the master and do that with respect and obedience. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21. Silver vessels, but also vessels of wood, of earthenware, and some to honor, and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Okay, speaks of, uh, of being a vessel of honor. Who, who's that talking about here? Christians. You. Me. Right? We're to be vessels of honor, but we can only be vessels of honor if what? Cleansed ourselves. Notice uh, verse 19, right before Jason started reading. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity, depart from sin, right? And then it goes into what we read about there's not, in a great house, there's not only vessels of gold and silver, but you've got wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, then he'll be a vessel for honor, sanctified or set apart, useful for the master, prepared for, as, as Shirley was saying, every good work. And then the very next verse after that talks about flee also youthful lust. And what we are to be pursuing, righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call the Lord out of your heart. So, if, if verses 20 and 21 at any time maybe challenges, what is that talking about? Just look at the verse before and the verse after. And, and, and the Lord wants us to be vessels of honor, useful uh, for the master. And we can't be useful if, if we're compromising and we're trying to keep a foot in the church and a foot in the world. No, we have to depart from iniquity, depart from sin, flee those th things Otherwise, we can't be useful to the master's service. We want to be useful for our master's service. Jason? I, mean, I would probably go all the way back up to verse 14, but specifically verse 15. Yeah. I mean, we are presenting ourselves as vessels, and you do that by proving yourself to be a diligent worker, someone that is wanting to rightly handle the word of truth. Uh, likewise, you're not going to be like these other fellows who are not vessels for honor, Hymenaeus, and Philetus. Uh, so the whole context there, I think, is important. <coughs> right. Just keep on backing up. You get some more good stuff, right? Okay. Um, 1 Peter 2, 17. That'd be Norm 8. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Okay. So specifically, honor who? Yeah, it begins with show the proper respect to everyone. Honor, honor all. So... Um, Obviously, we were to, to honor one another. We started there in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, our fellow Christians. But now, here's this exhortation and instruction to, to honor everyone. You think that'll make a difference? You think that might be part of being a salt to the earth? Distinct and, and, and stand out and a light into the world and good works if we're showing honor to everybody? And respect to all, yeah, it'll make a big difference, won't it? And then he goes on to say, honor the king, and that, you know, that stands representative for the, those who have been uh, in positions of authority, thinking back to those governing authorities. First Peter 3, 7, John. Husbands, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Okay, so who's to be honored here? Well, Shirley, you were quick to say that. <laughs> Wife. And I know, I'm, I know Ray does, right, Ray? Uh, uh, all of us husbands and those who are not husbands to be, we need those reminders. And dwell with the wife with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. And we're reminded that we're what together? We're fellow heirs. We're heirs together of the grace of life. And if husbands fail to give honor to the wife, to dwell, to strive to dwell with them with understanding, 
uh, what does it going to negatively impact our prayers? And then what he says at the end? That your prayers may not be hindered. Need some motivation? That's, there it is. There's some motivation right there in the verse. Okay, Ken? Where the women are told to love their husbands. I think it's in First Timothy, somewhere in Timothy. I don't remember exactly where. Titus but, 2. Oh, Titus 2, okay. Uh, so, but, and I think it's more of a problem with men because I think all through history, the Jewish people, they had a, they sort of, the, the women were kind of put in the background, I guess you could say. And we see that in scripture. Women at many times are not mentioned. It's the men that are mentioned doing this or that. Uh, although that's not always true. But uh, so I think, you know, uh, men honoring women, I think, is something that can be a challenge for us. Okay. Maybe, maybe more so than the other way around. I don't know if that's really true. So both are to honor respect. Ephesians 5, 33, the wives are reminded to respect their husbands. We are to value our wife. And again, she has to hear that. We may be thinking that, boy, I really appreciate her. And a lot of times I'm thinking about that about April. Boy, she does so much for this family, but she needs to hear that, right? Our wives need to hear how much we value and, and respect them and appreciate them and honor them. It is 745, so make it quick. You got it? Okay. So... Pages 26 and 27. Oh, there's the second bell. Um, seeking honor. We shouldn't for ourselves, right? Shouldn't seek honor for ourselves. Uh, it's about others. So are you fulfilling your part of this one another responsibility? Next week, looking forward to forgive one another. Looking forward to that study. All right.